lots to cover, an important show, but first, this blockbuster story. Archbishop of St. Paul, Minnesota, Bernard Hebdo, has, along with his brother bishops in Minnesota, announced they will defy Governor Tim Walz's decision to restrict public worship services. Earlier this week, Waltz announced that restaurants, bars, and salons could reopen in a limited capacity, but his ban on public worship services of more than 10 people would remain in effect. Nor would he make any concessions for outdoor services with proper social distancing. In a letter by Archbishop Hebda, signed by the other Minnesota bishops, Catholic parishes will have the option of opening on May 26th, just ahead of the Feast of Pentecost. Quote, the bishops of Minnesota are united in our conviction that we can safely resume public masses in accordance with both our religious duties and with accepted public health and safety standards. End quote. The Minnesota South District of the Lutheran Church announced they will do the same in their churches. More on this later in the program. Pope Francis celebrated Mass at the tomb of St. John Paul II on the 100th anniversary of the late Pope's birth on May 18th. Francis spoke of his predecessor as a shepherd and a prophet. He said, 100 years ago, the Lord visited his people. He sent a man, prepared him to be bishop, and led the church. He sent a pastor. This marked the last morning mass to be streamed by the Pope during the pandemic. Joining us now, since the coronavirus lockdown, religious practice all over the world has been severely curtailed. Why is the fundamental freedom of religion being suppressed while supermarkets and department stores and even casinos begin to reopen? For more, I'm delighted to be joined by the former head of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, Cardinal Gerhard Mueller, who joins us from EWTN Studios in Rome. Your Eminence, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Your Eminence, I want to start with the Archbishop Carlo Vigano's recent letter. Uh, it was called The Appeal for the Church and the World Regarding the Coronavirus Crackdown on Religious Practice by Governments All Over the World. Here's a bit of what Archbishop Vigano wrote. As pastors, we firmly assert the right to decide autonomously on the celebration of Mass and the sacraments, just as we claim absolute autonomy in matters falling within our immediate jurisdiction, such as liturgical norms and ways of administering communion and the sacraments. The state has no right to interfere for any reason whatsoever in the sovereignty of the church. Uh, your thoughts, uh, your, your eminence, you signed this letter, along with other bishops, including uh, Athanasia Schneider and others. Why did you feel it was necessary to sign a letter like this at this moment? Yes, ask, Archbishop Vigano asked me uh, for signing uh, by telephone, and I said I will support him to overcome the isolation, all the tensions between the Vatican and, and him, and we must give a good uh, example uh, for the reconciliation within the Church, and also I that um, it is not possible that we say as bishops anything to the medical problems of the virus. But we have to speak against the instrumentalization um, of this virus, of this uh, big uh, world crisis, global crisis, um, mm -hmm. by some dictatorial states or by other ideological uh, groups which want to take the opportunity to suppress the church, to make a breakdown of the sacramental life of the church. The church is uh, responsible for their own sacraments, for the worshiping and for the thanksgiving uh, to God. And we have only to take over the measures of the state for the security, medical security of the people. But the state as such cannot say we forbid uh, the worshiping. The, we are not the state church, uh, the Anglo-Saxon uh, tradition. Uh, they have the, the, the church is uh, subordinated to the state, but that is, that is not the Catholic uh, conception. Um, we have the fundamental religious rights, uh, the human rights, and the state must respect these rights of everybody. And it only can interfere in the security, medical security of the people. But this is absolutely contradictory. Uh, 
um, contradictorial to open the supermarkets and other assemblies and to close the church. In France, for example, um, the Supreme Court decided against the state that when he said if there is a proportion between the measures, if uh, the other institutions are open, there must be also the church are be opened. Mm. Your, Your Eminence, you, you mentioned, and I think rightly, that these are inherent rights. And in the United States, these are rights that we believe were conferred by the Creator, by God Himself. And therefore, th th they can mm -hmm. be conscripted for a limited time for emergency reasons. But after that, you have to take a hard look and say, how long does this emergency go on? Now, you and others were criticized for your support of Archbishop Vigano in this appeal. You've been accused of being a conspiracy theorist. I, I want to read another excerpt from the letter. You write here, or Archbishop Vigano wrote in the letter you signed, we have reason to believe on the basis of official data on the incidence of the epidemic as related to the number of deaths that there are powers interested in created, creating panic among the world's population with the sole aim of permanently imposing unacceptable forms of restriction on freedoms, of controlling people and of tracking their movements. The imposition of these illiberal gestures or measures is a disturbing prelude to the realization of a world government beyond all control. Do you see a global agenda here in the handling of this pandemic? A yeah, global agenda, in, in a certain sense, we have uh, a big number of dictatorial states which are enemies uh, to the Christianity or to the re against the religion. And in some totalitarian states, a big totalitarian states with no religious freedom. And we have uh, some powers, uh, global players who are against the Catholic Church because the Catholic Church is pro-life, pro-family, and uh, for uh, the religious freedom. And they want to instrumentalize this situation for suppress uh, the Catholic Church. Your Eminence, you know what many of these governors and, and states would say. They would say, look, we're protecting the health and well-being of the people. That's our first obligation. And if that requires shutting down masses or, or asking people to stay home, so be it. You would say what? In some cases, it could be, be right. But if I said if um, the other possibilities are given, if you can go in the supermarket, why you cannot go to the church? Why is the danger mm -hmm. in the church is bigger than in the supermarket? And also in mm -hmm. the other cases, nobody has the right to forbid to, for the priests, the shepherds, to visit the people who are dying or um, very ill. Um, there are also social, religious right uh, to have a pastoral care in these uh, cases. And, um, the security for your life is not the only value we have. We have all the spiritual values. We cannot isolate uh, totally um, the whole the population. is not possible. No, in other mm -hmm. cases, it's not possible. And we have, uh, yeah. we have other uh, illnesses and other dangers in our life, and we cannot uh, remain absolutely in our home. Uh, your, your Eminence, Cardinal Robert Sarah, the Prefect of the Congregation for Divine Worship and the Discipline of the Sacraments, weighed in on the coron coronavirus pandemic this week in an op-ed. He wrote this, The Church has committed herself to the struggles for a better world. She has been right to support ecology, peace, dialogue, solidarity, and the equitable distribution of wealth. All these struggles are just, but they could make us forget the words of Jesus. My kingdom is not of this world. COVID-19 laid bare an insidious disease that's eating away at the church. She thought that she was of this world. The church must change. She must stop being afraid of causing shock and of going against the tide. Your thoughts on that, Your Eminence? Has the church become too worldly or forgotten its mission in, in the name of all of these uh, social justice, if you will, initiatives? 
Uh, we are cooperating with uh, secular institutions in, for social justice and peace and ecology. But our main mission is uh, to preach the kingdom of God, uh, the deep values and the love to God and to the neighbor, to the next, and to um, celebrate uh, the sacraments, to give the grace and to give consolation and to give hope. And it's clear a human being is not living by bread alone, but also by the word is coming from God. And who want to forbid the church to do their work and to complete their mission to preach the gospel and to come together? Next week, beginning May 24th, the Vatican begins a year-long celebration of the fifth anniversary of Pope Francis's environmental encyclical Laudato Si. Why dedicate such time, Your Eminence, and effort commemorating the encyclical of a current pope? What about, as you were just talking about, evangelization or fighting the secular culture that seems bent on suppressing religious expression? China comes to mind. With everything facing the church, should this environmental uh, encyclical be the primary concern right now? This was not an environmental encyclical, but was a encyclical about the creation and with some consequences for the ecology. Uh, but the basic uh, message is that God is a creator of everybody. We are living in a common house. We have common responsibility for this world, mm -hmm. but not only for this world, for the short time of our life here on this world, of this planet, but we have a bigger responsibility for the eternal um, salvation, uh, of, for the eternal life uh, of everybody. And therefore, in this situation now, after this breakdown of the sacramental life of the church, it is very important the evangelization to preach the gospel uh, and to give to people the hope that also in cases of our diseases and of our death, uh, of, of the short life and all the accidents which are in this world, we have a wider horizon. God is mm -hmm. the... Uh, first principle and the last aim, the last goal which we are going uh, to. And we cannot restrict the human existence also in a materialistic interpretation and, uh, and as if we were able to construct a paradise on earth is not possible. Your Eminence, uh, we hear a lot about transparency, uh, not only in the United States but at the Vatican. In the midst of this coronavirus pandemic, We've heard very little about the McCarrick report, uh, former Cardinal uh, Theodore McCarrick and, and his misdeeds. The Vatican was doing a full review of the records that they have in their possession. They promised to release this for over a year. Why haven't we seen it? And will we ever see it? I don't know. I'm not involved in this investigation, but I think it would be very good for the credibility of the church and to avoid in the future some problems. Uh, if it uh, would be published, uh, become public, uh, this investigation, because it was, uh, was uh, promised. And I hope also that uh, Archbishop Vigano, that would come a certain reconciliation, because it's not a good example for the world if bishops and the Vaticans are in uh, public trouble. Yeah. The church and the world remembered the 100th birthday of Pope John Paul II this week, who left us in April of 2005. It's hard to believe it's been that long. Before I let you go, what are your thoughts on the lasting legacy of St. John Paul, and what of his example do we need today, or do we need reminding of today? Yeah, in his life, he experienced two totalitarian states and ideologies, and he knew what he was speaking about. And he said in the beginning, don't be afraid. We are living together with Jesus Christ. Jesus, Jesus Christ is our hope. And we know what all is happening 
in this world, what injustice is there. Um, but he survived these two cruel dictatorships in his countries, where only the Nazis killed six million people in Poland. He knows what he is speaking about. Um, mm -hmm. And therefore, he can say the urgent point in our world today is the dignity of man, of every body. Every body is created by God and has a deep dignity as a person. And this is a way of the church of today to preach this gospel of the worth, of the uh, dignity and the importance of everybody, of every person. We cannot say, no, some elites or some rich people, and they have more rights uh, to live than the poor people in Africa or in Asia. And we must, in a paternalistic way, we must care for them and, 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 and don't accept uh, their responsibility, their dignity. And we cannot uh, treat them as if they were uh, not uh, people with, without uh, formation and so, and we are, as church, we are obliged to, to help, to, to preach to everybody and to announce the uh, dignity of everybody and the collaboration of everybody uh, in this uh, world. And the church is a sacrament mm -hmm. for the deep unity between God mm -hmm. and man, but also for the unity of mankind. Yeah. Now, Your Eminence, whenever I think of John Paul II, I think of personal liberty and spiritual liberty and freedom, which it seems to me that and human uh, respect for the dignity of the human person, those three pillars really defined his life. Uh, it was the subject of every one of his travels and the personal witness of his life. Cardinal Gerhard Mueller, I thank you so much for being with us. Your most recent book, Roman Encounters, the Unity of the Faith and the Holy See's Responsibility for the Universal Church is still available from EWTN's religious catalog at EWTNRC.com. Your Eminence, we'll talk again soon. Thank you very much.